So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Anna Mule. I'm the Director of Communications and Campaigns at Slow Food USA, and I'm so excited to have this dynamite panel with us to talk about seed saving and um, preserving culinary traditions. We are talking specifically about Deeply Rooted, which is a documentary um, featuring John Koikendall. We um, had the national premiere of Deeply Rooted at Slow Food Nations this past July. I'm really excited to work with um, Camellia Beans and our partners to put this panel together today. This is all part of our um, September membership drive. And today is actually Give What You Can Day. So all of you callers, if you're not officially a member of Slow Food USA, this is a great chance you can give at any level. You can give a dollar, you could give $300. Um, so any gift makes you a member and there's a link on our on our website right there. Um, I also wanna thank Camellia Brand Beans. They have been a great partner um, on all of this uh, content, all these projects. They put together these fabulous viewing parties and made them available to Slow Food Chapters so that chapters across the country, and you can see the list here, could request a viewing kit that included a DVD of the documentary, plus a fabulous package of beans and rice from Camellia. Um, and you could see this link at the bottom here um, has um, some information about, about Camellia and about the um, viewing parties that, that we're doing. So if you live in one of these areas, um, and you can see it on the screen here, if you live in one of these areas, um, connect with your local chapter and see when they're doing this viewing party because I want to be there. It looks really fun. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So if you have questions for any of the panelists, you can put them into the chat box here in GoToMeeting. Or if you're calling in via phone, you could um, email slow, um, comms at slowfoodusa.org. That's C-O-M-M-S at slowfoodusa.org. And I'll be getting all those questions in and asking them at the end of our conversation um, of, our, of our panelists. Um, I uh, was not able to actually show the trailer of the documentary today, but I encourage everyone to take a look um, at the trailer when you get off this call, just so you can get a sense of the beautiful visuals of the of the film and um, really enjoy the, um, the the stories that are being told here. Um, we're also recording this call today, so if you um, want to share it afterwards, we'll be posting it on our Facebook group so that you can um, listen in and share it around. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce okay. our moderator here, Poppy Tooker. Poppy is a longtime uh, slow food champion. She has done a ton of work with the Arc of Taste, our biodiversity catalog. Um, she is based in Louisiana and runs a podcast called Louisiana Eats, which is um, a, a, an NPR affiliate and is also available via podcast. Uh, Louisiana Eats, each episode takes listeners from to the fields and farms, restaurants and home kitchens where the food action is really happening. Along the way, listeners personally get to know the people and stories who are part of the renowned food culture of Louisiana. <coughs> So I'm thrilled to have Poppy on the call here, along with Christina Melton and John Koikendall. And I'm going to just stop talking and let Poppy take it from here. Well, I am thrilled as well, because any opportunity that I ever have to speak with John Koikendall is such an honor. Um, this 74-year-old gentleman who we're speaking with today preaches the seed gospel and has spent most of his life with his hands in the dirt. You all may have heard of him from his work at Blackberry Farm, one of America's most celebrated resorts. He's the master gardener there and thus responsible for a lot of the yummy ingredients that end up on plates there. He is a revered preservationist of heirloom seeds and their stories. And Sitting in there, John is also a classically trained artist, and he studied at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And for 
four decades now. So interesting to me. He has made an annual pilgrimage from his home in Tennessee to a very small farming community right here in my home state of Louisiana. And he has recorded the oral histories of the farmers who he befriended and preserved their family seeds and their stories. He collected over the time more than 80 beautiful illustrated journals. They did notes, he wrote pictures, full of farming and gardening heritage. And that forms the basis of Christina Melton's documentary. Um, Deeply Rooted is an amazing, amazing piece. Everybody should make sure they watch it. And Christina Hendrick Melton is a documentary filmmaker and director of special projects for Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Um, she's been broadcast na nationally on PBS, and she's gotten some of the top awards the documentary filmmakers can get, including the Alfred DuPont Columbia University Award for Excellence in Journalism. And she's even won Emmys. I'm so impressed. And in 2011, her film, Turning the Tide, earned the Louisiana Conservationist of the Year Award from the National Wildlife Federation. Her new work, Deeply Rooted, John Kuykendall's Journey to Save Our Seeds and Stories, will be nationally distributed September 29th by American Public Television. And Christina is hard at work writing a companion book with John for LSU Press. So hello, John and Christina. Thanks so much for being available today. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. Oh, so well, pleased to join in. I, I would love to start the story, John, um, about Blackberry Farm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your work there and w what you're growing, what's growing now? What, tell us a little bit about Blackberry. I've been working there for 18 years as the master gardener. And we do, this is classically farm to table, literally from the soil up. The people that I studied with were all born in the 1880s up to the early 1900s, so they were the old school of farming, which is what we practice there now, organic farming. I remember a lot of the old people used to say we were organic farmers and didn't know it. We didn't have anything else. And they were seed savers by necessity because there was no other way. You had to save your own seeds or trade with neighbors. But Blackberry Farm is a relay and chateau, well-known all over the world. It's a wonderful resort in the Smoky Mountains, wonderful place to visit. And I've been fortunate enough to farm there for 18 years. And all of the things we grow are heirloom in nature. In other words, real food. We don't have any well, plastic tomatoes there. <laughs> I imagine a lot of those things actually come out of your own stash because You've been collecting seeds for 50 years, and I hear you have over 500 different varieties saved, and you're hoping to live long enough to grow them all. We, we, we all, all wish that. And could you tell us, how did you come to care so much about this topic? I, I understand it has a root in your two loves, art and farming. I'll tell you about the the seeds and everything. You talked about having over five, 500 varieties. I can't afford to die. It would ruin my reputation. Plus, I wouldn't get those things grown out. But I had my earliest beginnings with that were beginning in 1959 when I visited an abandoned railroad station west of Knoxville, and I found a 1913 William Henry Miles seed catalog. And I was fascinated with that, all those beautiful old varieties. And that was the beginning of my quest to become a seed saver because I began looking, asking people about these old varieties. At that time, we had no formal networks for seed saving. The Seed Savers Exchange, top one in the world for that conserving genetic mm -hmm. diversity on a private basis, didn't exist at that time. Today, we can pull out our cell phones and type in anything, and you can come up with half an hour's worth of reading on any variety that you can mention. It's it, The networking is incredible. Plus, we have uh, organizations all over the world now that are doing this, so it's easy to network. John, why is this so important to you? W what is the correlation between humans and seeds? 
How do you see this story playing through? Well, it's history, heritage, culture, a way of life, culinary life. These, so many of these things in the past have been lost. If I had one wish, if there was such a thing as a time machine, I wouldn't be going back looking for the Aztec gold. I'd be looking to, for the old seeds and trying to bring everything forward into modern times. My biggest regret is that we didn't start 100, 150 years ago when so much of it was still intact. The whole seed saving movement is really fairly new. The Seed Savers Exchange, for instance, was founded in 1975, and that's yesterday in terms of <laughs> preservation and looking for things. So we were late in the 11th hour when we started. You might say just in the nick of time. Now, just in the I'm, nick of time. <laughs> I'm very fascinated about how you came to be drawn to this one little Louisiana town, Franklinton, Louisiana. You can blink and miss it pretty much if you're driving south to north or the other way. What? How did your story begin there in that little Louisiana town in Washington Parish? The story began August 1974. <laughs> I was in school with Jennifer Weiss. We were good friends, and she invited me down in August for a visit. And I went down, and the rest is history. Now, she married a man named John from Tennessee, but not this one. However, I married the family, and I still go down and visit the family every October, sometimes more. Let's talk about your amazing journals. I have had the extreme privilege of actually getting to touch them and look in them. Tell us about some of those rare plants and the animals that you have documented. and. Really, the visuals are fabulous. I love your drawings, John. When I first began, I really didn't have the intention of doing the work as I'm doing it today. I just knew that talking to those old people and their manner of speech, the way they spoke, a lot of it's reminiscent of Elizabethan English, a lot of the old terms that you don't hear anymore today, and plus their description of farming, their methods and their lives, I knew that I wanted to preserve that. I said, this is too good to let go. If I don't get this down, pretty soon they're not going to be here, and I don't know who will record it. So when I started out, it was with little spiral notebooks, the kind you can stick in your shirt pocket. It wasn't anything fancy. Later on, I, as I got farther into the subject, I began to use the moleskin books, which are great for drawing and writing anything I want from recipes to farming methods to the story of seeds. All well, of these, I, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, all <laughs> of these seeds tell a story. One of the most important things that we do as seed savers is a process known as memory banking. In other words, if I come to your house and you have a given variety, I want to know your name, your family history, where did this come from? If your ancestors came over from Europe, then want to know, did they bring this bean or tomato with them? How was it grown? What were its culinary uses? Any information at all that I can record on that turns it into living history. It's living history to start with, just the crop. But it's so very important to have the stories to go with them. Otherwise, we've just got a table full of bowls of beans. I've often told guests at Blackberry that if I bring you into this garden shed and I have 50 bowls of different beans and pea seed and limas on the table, and I say, well, here's some beans, here's some peas, here's some butter beans, and they look at that, and they're going to say, uh, yes, I see that. Now, what else do you have to offer? But when I can <laughs> tell them the story about the wash day pea, for instance, I collected that pea about 20 years ago, and it came from around Charleston, South Carolina in the 1790s. And on wash day, it was literally wash day. They had to work all day long. The ladies had to get up. They had a real hard go of it. They would have to build fires under the cast iron kettles, shave off the lye soap into it, stir those clothes with the big paddles, had rinsing waters. They had battling boards to beat the dirt out, had to wring those out, hang those clothes up. Now, at the end of the day, Mother was in no mood whatsoever to cook us fellas a big fancy supper. So what we were going to get was the wash day pea, and the reason they chose the wash day pea, it's a small yellowish tan pea, and it will cook up 
in about the same time as you can bake a pone of cornbread. Now, if you hadn't made the lady of the house mad through the rest of the week, you might be lucky enough to get a slice of onion to go with it. But that was basically <laughs> it, possibly the first fast food. Well, you know, that is so fascinating because um, my dear friend, Richard McCarthy, who, of course, is executive director of Slow Food USA, he always used to say, we've been slow down here in Louisiana since anybody told us it was a good thing to be. And <laughs> I'm so surprised to learn of this wash day tea that cooks quickly because down here, we rely on camellia bean, red beans. That's our wash day bean. And it's always on a Monday. And whether you're doing laundry or not, everybody in New Orleans eats red beans on Monday. So that is a fascinating tie-in because they said that those red beans simmered on the stove while everybody was doing the wash and you didn't have to think was, about it. So. Yeah, I was just going to add that that was, uh, that was their version of it and still is today. But talk so about we, camellia beans. Mercy, I love those things. I keep the... We, we love those red beans. We love those red beans. So... Tell us about the snow on the mountain butter bean, because that is figured in pretty significantly for you. That one dates back to 1880 in the McDonald family down in Washington Parish, and there was a man named Reverend Roy Blunt. He sold syrup and sweet potatoes, and I went to get him initially just to get to buy some syrup from him, and he said I was, I was talking about the old seeds. He also had the sugar crowder, and he gave me some of those, and he said, I've got this butter bean. It's called Snow on the Mountain, and the reason it was called Snow on the Mountain, it's a fairly large butter bean. It has maroon coloring at the bottom, a deep maroon, and white feathering at the top that resembles snow on a mountain peak. That one actually dates back to 1840, and when we say butter bean, it usually refers to the speckled types like you find in the deep south, the, the ones that have coloring on them, Florida speckle, Jackson Wonder, and those types. And those uh, take on that name. Now, I've heard one reason that they're called butter beans is several of the ladies told me that they would actually cook them in, with a lot of butter and whole milk, milk with a lot of cream in it. And so that would have that rich butter bean taste. It had the butter with it that was just one way of cooking those. So you've been preserving recipes along with the rest of the stuff you've documented. I always write that down in the notebooks, especially if I have dinner at someone's house. I mean, one of the habits, you probably know this, if you go to someone's house out in the country, they always have these bowls on the table, bowls of butter beans, field peas, cream corn, collard greens, whatever they're serving. It's a big bowl sitting on the kitchen table. That's some of my fondest memories, sitting around Ma and Paul Lang's kitchen table. And sometimes I'd go that, I'd go back to eat that evening with them, and she would say, well, we're having couldn'ts tonight. I said, couldn'ts? What's couldn'ts? She said, that's what we couldn't eat at dinner time. We're having that for supper. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great name for leftovers. <laughs> now, y there's so many beans, there's so many stories, but... I, according to you, the Red Ripper bean, which is another bean from 1840, is the best tasting bean you ever tasted. And I, that whole relationship between taste and memory and preserving history is tied so closely together. Why is that Red Ripper bean the best bean for eating? It has a wonderful flavor. That First of all, this is a cornfield type. Most of your real old field peas had long vines, and they were commonly grown in the corn fields. Corn takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil, and your field peas, being legume fixers, they, they fix that back into the soil, so it's a wonderful companion planting or intercropping plant. So they have long vines. In return, the corn stalk makes a free bean stick for the peas to climb up. So that was a very, very common practice. In today's world, we, most of your ones are modern bread ones, or bread for combining. A lot of them have the peas stick up above the foliage, and the combine goes along and easily harvest that. That would be impossible with, with your long vining types. But the Red Ripper, to me, is, as a field pea, it, has a, it combines the very best qualities of a field pea 
and a fresh green bean. Now, when I'm talking about fresh, I'm talking about what we call green shell. Green shell mm-hmm. means you're shelling those peas or beans while they're still hydrated, and so they have that uh, have that wonderful uh, flavor in there. And this one, to me, if I had to give an accurate description, it would almost be like a cross between, say, a, a red bean and a field pea. There's there's qualities of both in it, but they have just a heavenly flavor. One of my favorites. The only my second favorite one is the South Carolina calico crowder it's a white pea with the maroon modeling on it and it has a very very that would be a close second well out of all the seeds that you have discovered over the 50 years of seed collecting which was the most elusive what was your most exciting find my most hands down i would have to say the unknown pea of washington parish louisiana about 30 years ago, Mr. Lang and some of the old timers told me about a field pea that everyone grew, and it was called the Unknown Pea of Washington Parish. And it had that name because no one knew where it came from. No one uh, knew anything else about it. Where did it come from? A name. It didn't have any name, so it was simply took on the name of the Unknown Pea. <laughs> and I thought to myself, gosh, I've got to have this for my collection. And everyone said, well, it's gone. No one has it anymore. <laughs> And as a seed saver, I I just couldn't fathom that, how so many people could have grown that for so long. And then all of a sudden, one day it was gone. No one had it. I would always think, surely some old timer somewhere had a few around if just to show the grandchildren what they were. Well, about six years ago, a good friend of mine named Gus McGee down in Washington Parish came to the fair with a small bottle of these unknown peas that I found this from for you. So there was an old fellow, 87 years old, up the road that was still growing some. So that was a, that was a real treasure. I kept those on my pillow all the way to spring, time to plant. I, I'd pour a few out every day. I'd pour a few out and look at them in the morning, and put them back in the jar, pour them out on the pillow at night and look at them and count the days till they could go in the ground. That was a huge, huge thrill. And I say thrill. I think that was the best feeling of accomplishment: saving something, finding something. It was uh, it was better than 20 Christmases strung together when you were a child. It must have been really exciting when those first little plants poked their heads up through the soil. Oh, gosh, yes. And then when you have the immature pods, and then finally when they dried and you started shelling those first peas, you know, there's a sigh of relief. And you think, boy, this one's in the bank, so to speak. In other words, it's out of danger. And That's I've tried insane. to return it to a number of people down there, too, to get the renew the interest in growing it. You know, there's so much said today, so much talk about climate change. And goodness knows, <laughs> with the hurricanes, with the dramatic weather we've had, um, everybody has to be a little aware of that climate change issue now. How does the seed saving fit in with our climate change issues? It has a tremendous role to play because many, many of your old crops were very drought tolerant. They required very little input. In other words, water or fertilizer, field peas, you don't want to put fertilizer on them. If you fertilize peas, they'll look like kudzu. In other words, they're just all growing and no production. So it's a it's very important in that respect. And when I say little input, a lot of your modern GMOs and things produce very, very well, but they they require a lot of input, fertilizers, irrigation, sprays, all sorts of things to keep them going. They don't fare well on their own. A lot of the, for instance, our butter beans, the old varieties, the snow on the mountain, for instance, it displays the old habit of shattering. When those pods are dry and you touch them, they pop and the seeds will fly out. And that's the that's the ancestral trait of that old variety, it's still expressing that. A modern butter bean, it's gotten lazy, dependent on us, so you have to pry it open. Now, John, I'm very curious about this, because along with climate change, those issues mean that the weather's changing, so maybe something that grew one place maybe isn't gonna grow there so well anymore and might need to change its region. How do you feel about taking things that have strong regional ties 
out of the region and sharing them nationally. Oh, I believe in it 100%. Now, some things, for instance, field peas and uh, Lima's butter beans, they're not going to do well in, in the far north. In other words, there's some areas yeah. that things aren't suited for, but you would choose the things, legumes like beans, which would do very well in most parts of the country. I'll give you a good example of that. We're doing Blackberry Farm is helping out with the Seed Savers Exchange collection. They sent us eight things this year. Being in Decorah, Iowa, that climate doesn't allow, allow a lot of things to reach maturity for seed saving. So we took uh, a couple of their butter beans and field peas, and we're growing those out to to replenish that. In other words, to increase that stock so they're not in danger of losing those. But I think it's it's very important to to distribute so, these seeds far and wide. Everybody should give it a try, one one way or another. And in that, you know, everybody can become part of this work now. And you know, you've devoted your life to this. When you look into the future, what do you think is coming down the road? What do you think the future of your work is? I want to continue on the road I'm on. I want to keep doing that. I, I try to collect as many things as possible. But in, in terms of uh, climate change and everything else, I hope we adapt well. I think that uh, many of our crops, things that, especially drawing from the old ones, we've become so used to having this mega farming, mega farms and all this this production, five or 6,000 acres devoted to one crop that's a, the mm -hmm. monoculture. It, it favors two things. It favors pests and lawyers. <laughs> a pest only has to <laughs> pest only has to overcome one gene, perhaps in a wheat crop, and then it's just like breaking through the lines. It destroys everything in sight. Our ancestors had literally thousands of varieties. Wheat, for instance, the, the wheat field going back to the very earliest of time, 10,000 years ago, it would have some plants that were really tall, some that were short, some that were medium range, and they would often develop at different times, but they had uh, wonderful resistance. They had problems too, of course, just like today, but they had so many things that it would, one uh, blight wouldn't wipe out an entire crop. John, you've saved so many seeds. And I know you've saved the stories along with them. Is there any particular family history that is closely tied to a seed that you've saved that, that really stands out in your mind? Every family has some kind of a story. Now, some will be more colorful than others, but I think about uh, one bean that I have someone gave me from Virginia. And a fellow named... Uh, by the name of, hold on a second, Moses Bonham, Moses Bonham Glover. He was with General Lee at the surrender at Appomattox. Now, I don't have any more history than that, but the thing about that is it, the date alone and the fact that a person was General Lee at Appomattox, it tells you the time period, what was going on in history, what life would have been like. And so we can fill in an awful lot of blanks if we have just a little bit of information. And another one that I really love is a red calico butter bean I have that uh, dates to 1794 from a family in Upper East Tennessee. And now that's all the information I have. But if you think about that for a minute, you think George Washington was around, Thomas Jefferson, and look at all the way of life. If you looked out the door, you'd see giant uh, haystacks and yokes of oxen pulling plows walk-in fireplace in the kitchen and just think what we all look like, our clothing, everything. And then you come all the way down through history to present times, and you have a chain with no links missing, perfectly preserved, coming all the way down to present. And that, to, to me, is fascinating to think how far back that goes, and it's still with us, and how important it is to save that. Well, it really does make it all taste better. I know I know that for sure. And with all of your successes, are there any seeds that you have lost or that you're still desperately seeking out? I don't have a particular one right now, but I'm always on the lookout. And uh, someone once asked me, why do you have such a passion for beans? 
one of the most important reasons I look back to the time of our early ancestors. We'll take the example of Cades Cove just across the mountain from Blackberry Farm. When they settled there in 1818, they came in with very little. The Three Sisters Garden would have been the primary source of food beginning in those first couple of years. And the Three Sisters Garden consists of the corn, the beans, and the squash, and pumpkins. Those were all the corn was planted when it was waist high. Beans were planted at the base of it, which ran up the corn stalks. Your pumpkins and winter squash were interspersed throughout the field, and they covered the ground with those heavy leaves and vines, kept weeds down and moisture in, so it was an excellent intercropping system. But one of my big points on beans and why it was so fascinating to me is the fact that so many of those were handed down, especially here in the Appalachian region. There's more diversity for beans in this Appalachian region than there is in the rest of the country combined. It's a tremendous amount. A good friend of mine, Bill Best, up in Kentucky, has over 700 varieties. I thought I was a big bean saver, 300, 330-something, but I'm the junior of the operation. But beans were what I refer to as, as a 365-day-a-year crop. In other words, in your survival in those days, you were depending on beans, just as one example, to carry you through for 365 days in some form. In the spring, you had the, the early beans and you had the cornfield beans. They dried those out and made leather britches, which were strung up and hung on the rafters of the front porch. And those were used in the winter, reconstituted. So it, uh, I call it also a poverty food, not because you were poor, because this would starve or stave off starvation. And it was it was a very, very important crop. So you were eating this in some form, 365 days a year. Well, that's a beautiful and delicious story. And Christina, you have been so quiet sitting with us this whole time. I would love for you to tell us how this documentary came about. Well, uh, my husband and I were guests at Blackberry Farm. And like many guests, uh, we were drawn to the beautiful gardens and walked down, just were wandering around and found at the corner of the property, um, the little garden shed, um, tin roof garden shed, where John generally sits and found him sitting in a rocking chair shelling peas and started to talk to him about Louisiana. And he mentioned his connections with Louisiana and mentioned his journals. And I have been a filmmaker for about 20 years now and love storytelling and love visuals. And he brought in these journals the next day. We went back to the shed to talk to him again. And the second I saw these journals, I just could not believe that the story really had never been told. The volume of material that he has collected over these years is astounding. And then just to talk to him more and more. I mean, obviously you can just listen to him. He's just a, uh, a wealth of wisdom and um, just has so much experience in, in preserving these stories from these people that he's met that a lot of times, a lot of people would maybe not think twice about sitting next to them and, and listening for so long. And so I just felt like this was a story that had to be told and um and so we we started working on it well what was your favorite part of the whole process of getting this made well aside from just getting to know john because i feel like he's enriched my life tremendously um just listening to some of these stories though it has really changed my perspective personally on food um on trying to think about where my food is coming from um the idea preparing food for my family is a lot easier than I, you know, I, I'm a soccer mom, essentially. I run my children from activity to activity and, and just listening to John and hearing the stories of these older generations of people who, who kind of look at us with this perplexed, you know, look on their faces, like, why are we doing this? Why are we living like this? And, um, and so it really has it sort of made me slow down and think about food as something that sustains our lives. What do you hope that this work will bring to the world? What, what 
what are your hopes and wishes? You know, any of us who are in this creative process, you make the documentary, you write the book, you cross your fingers and hope that it means something once you, you send your baby off into the world. So what are your hopes and wishes tied to the project? I hope people look at uh, food that you can grow yourself. Uh, the idea, John, that's another um, John hasn't really talked about, but this is not hard to, to grow your own food and to go seek out some of these heirloom seeds and to join this movement and, and furthering these heirloom varieties. You can play a role in that. You can contact Seed Savers Exchange. You can get to be in this sort of group and you can work to preserve these varieties yourself and then join in the movement to send these seeds seeds back and make sure that they're handed down. John has inspired me and then also the woman who was the photographer on the project. Um, we have gotten to be friends with John's friends in Washington Parish to the point where the unknown pea that John was talking about, they have planted fields of the unknown pea and Sarah Hackenberg, who's the photographer and I and our families went to visit the Lang family and pick and shell peas with them. And it's just full circle. It really is carrying on tra family traditions and passing it down to our children um, and then linking us with people in the community that we may not have been linked with otherwise. That is such a beautiful story. And there is nothing that brings people together like food. And when you add that element of growing food, it makes it even more exciting. John, you know, I know that we refer to you as um, the seed evangelist. You know, you're always preaching the gospel of seed. Tell us if you've got um, one message that you want to send out to everyone and have them here. Give us a little seed gospel. I usually talk to guests down at the garden shed. I said, come on in. We'll, we'll preach the bean or the seed gospel. And what I love, one of my favorite things, is when people have the experience of tasting something that's real. Now, the best, uh, getting away from beans for a minute, the best example of that is tomatoes. One of our activities I love in August, which is garden month for us at Blackberry, we always have tomato tasting every Saturday. And that will consist of anywhere from 35 to 50 heirloom varieties. Mm -hmm. And those are cut up, consists of three things a cutting board, a sharp knife, and some sea salt. And then I like to tell them the history of each variety, where it came from, and, and the other related stories. But people are amazed at that flavor. And for years, I couldn't figure out why it was that there were so many young people that didn't like tomatoes. And it finally dawned on me, well, there's, there's a whole generation that's never had a real tomato. You see your tomatoes out of South Florida, they come from... Uh, these farms where they're raised for mechanical harvesting, shipping, shelf life. They have a plastic skin and a styrofoam interior. Now, I'll tell you the one group that absolutely loves those tomatoes. You probably never heard this before. That's your baseball team because they use them for batting practice. You can put a strap or a pin on one of those things. Have about the same flavor, too. But then you have one of these wonderful heirloom tomatoes, and it's just like heaven. And we had a guest time a garden group came down to visit ladies and one of the ladies asked you well what do i do if i want a nice fresh tomato in january i said go to the store and buy a can of aromas and pour them into your salad bowl and dress them and the way you're accustomed it'll come a hundred percent closer to tasting like a real vine ripe tomato than one of those styrofoam things well that is very very good advice and great gospel now I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but, you know, once you've got the preacher in the house and you're hearing this gospel, <laughs> sometimes it's time to break into song. And you even have a little bean song that you sing to the tune of a very famous gospel hymn. Um, could, could I persuade you to give us a, a line or two? Oh, that you're talking about the uh, just a closer walk with thee. That's uh, in reference to <laughs> butter beans. Yes, Homer sure, Graves, yes. my old buddy in Washington Parish, used to sing that. Went something like that. Just a bowl of butter beans. Pass the cornbread, if you please. 
I don't want no collard greens, just a bowl of good old butter beans. <laughs> well, all I can say to that is <laughs> amen from all of the gardeners and eaters and farmers of the world. So, a amen. Um, you've been at the Tennessee Valley Fair winning blue ribbons lately, huh? Yes, that's uh, going on right now. Full, we have that fair last 10 days. And as I stated before, I always like to support that and enter produce in it. And you come down to the Washington Parish Fair down here in Louisiana, too, don't you? I've been going there since 1989. It's, uh, and what do you look forward to there every year? Well, my biggest thing is the ag exhibit. Mr. Henry Harrison, that's done that for years. He's head of the ag department. And we always enjoy talking and I love to talk to all the people that enter things. And it's a great, uh, great experience. It's it's kind of like a home reunion, family reunion. It's, you see all of these people once a year and it's, it's a celebration. That whole fair is, it's really family oriented. It's like a, a huge family reunion. It has that atmosphere. Christina, uh, I would love it if you could give us a little thought about how you would like people to host these deeply rooted uh, parties that is open now to slow food members across to chapters across the United States. Um, how do you envision a deeply rooted Camellia Red Bean and Rice party? Oh, well, I'm so thrilled that Camellia has um, helped us do this and to get, and that uh, Slow Food has helped us get this film into people's hands and in front of people, because that's truly the goal. And so we're, we had a screening at the um, Slow Food um, Nations Convention in Denver, and it was just wonderful. The conversation that arose following the film was fabulous. It really, um, I, I think, made people feel good about trying to get engaged in growing things and in thinking about where their food comes from and thinking in terms of their own culinary sort of family culinary heritage and things like that. So that is wonderful. The other thing we are, this film is being distributed by American Public Television at the end of this month, which means that public television stations around the country uh, will have the option to um, to record it and then to schedule and broadcast it. So we're hoping that uh, people, after they see the film, will be inspired to contact their local PBS station and ask them um, to broadcast it. And then also, if not, um, people can still uh, access the film um, through uh, Louisiana Public Broadcasting's website, lpb.org slash deeply rooted and you can get a digital download that way um, with a contribution to LPB, to Louisiana Public Broadcasting. So um, we just want people to come together and um, have a great meal and enjoy each other's company and really have that be the focus. Well, I'm, I know I'm inspired. I, I can't wait until Monday to get my red beans on the stove, to tell you the truth. And Anna, um, do you have some questions from the audience? I do indeed, and um, anyone who's not yet put in a question, you could put it in the chat box, or you can email comms, C-O-M-M-S, at slowfoodusa.org. But here's a question from Loretta. She says, I like the memory banking idea to have the living history behind our various seeds recorded. John, this is a question for you. Do you have a story of a seed we have lost, but we still have the story? There's so many have been lost over the years. There's there's ones that go back a hundred years. It's no way of calculating how many have been lost. And I'm sure many of those have had stories too. I don't have any particular stories about ones that have been lost. I've been so focused on the ones that are still here and saving those and getting all of that history down while it's still here. But I know that there's there are many, many stories out there. John, John I was going to get you to say, talk about you kind you did you kind of covered the snow on the mountain story but i think that's a really poignant illustration of the family heritage of these seeds tell tell everybody about how it was handed down 
Well, it was handed down. The McDonald family had it in 1880, and they handed it down to Reverend Blunt's family, and he's the one that gave it to me. I used to go out to his house, as I told you before, to buy syrup. I'd go out there, and he'd have his wife make some biscuits and said, we got to test this syrup out and make sure it's good. She'd make a big plate of biscuits, and we'd sit there and eat those and, and talk about that. And he talked about his family having grown that. They depended on it uh, year-round. It, it was another one of those 365-day-a-year crops. They produce a tremendous amount of seeds. You can start eating those in June, and they'll go all the way to almost Christmas when the first frost kills them. But you had them fresh in season. You had an awful lot of dried seeds for winter use and, of course, plenty for replanting. So it was literally one that easily went 365 days a year. And field peas were of that same nature. They were something that you had year-round. And you were you're heavily dependent on that. How was it handed down with, between grandmother and granddaughter? That was a different story. That was up in... Uh, fellow named Mr. Marriott up in the Little Improve community of Mississippi. I love that little uh, stop in the road. A little sign says, conveniently located in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but his neighbor was uh, 89 years old, and she told uh, she gave him, uh, it's the same bean, but uh, under a different name. She gave him that seed, and she told about this lady, the neighbor that's 89 years old, and she had gotten it from, uh, I think it was her, her grandmother when she was little. And her grandmother had gotten it when she was the age 13. And her grandmother had handed it down to her. And she told her, she said, you plant these, you'll have beans starting in June. You'll have them all the way to Christmas until the freeze kills them. You'll have uh, lots of dried beans for winter, soup beans. You'll have them to see you all the way through. She said, you take care of this. And you'll have this all of your life. That is such a beautiful story, ensuring food for future generations. And I, Seed Savers, of course, is <clears throat> such a great partner and has been to Slow Food USA. And I, when I was um, working on the Arc of Taste Committee, there were a lot of things that we boarded. People should know, if you're worried about how things taste, if it's on the slow food arc of taste, that means it tastes good. Because no matter how historical or um, endangered it may be, it's got to taste good because that is what we care about. And one of my favorite beans that is along the same lines that you just spoke about was the Trail of Tears bean, that shiny, Cherokee shiny. Cherokee Trail of Tears, right. Yeah. I'm sure you know that story. Yes, it was carried west in the Force March, it was the 1830s, and that was uh, that force marched out to Oklahoma, and that's one of the seeds they carried with them. Beautiful thought and a tragic story. That's absolutely the truth. Anna, do we have more yeah. questions? Here's a question maybe following up to that being um, Catherine is asking, in capturing your stories, did you have the opportunity to talk with Native Americans, African Americans, or Mexican Americans? She says, you know, many seeds have origins with the ancestors of these Americans. That's absolutely true. And you talk about Native Americans, they had a, a wealth of things. I have a number of things from the Cherokee Nation that I've collected from them, primarily beans and corn. So they have handed down an awful lot of things. We're going way, way back in history. And you talk about the origin, we refer to it as the centers of origin or centers of diversity, corn from Mexico and Central America, beans from Central America. So many crops came out of those regions and migrated, they made their way north. You know, we had an interstate, uh, system thousand years ago in this country it was just about a foot wide there was a footpath and things were traded and, and carried to different regions you can find flint down in florida that comes out of the hills of tennessee where the flint was traded for making arrows seeds the same way they made their, their way up um Any other questions? Annette, 
Uh, that's great. Another question, um, Laura um, is asking, where can folks get these rare variety beans? And is John a part of the Citizen Science Project at Seed Savers Exchange? The Seed Savers Exchange is a wonderful source for these. And if you become a member, they have a member's yearbook. It's a big, thick book, and I have 90 listings in that. And there's many, many others, other members that have things as well. And that's a great source. The section on tomatoes alone is many, many pages. But it's it's a great place to start out. And you can find just a, it's wonderful. It'll take you all winter to read that. But it's a great source. Um, and then Maureen um, has a comment here. She says, I've been spending my time cleaning all kinds of seeds from the summer. I'm way far away from the climate you all are part of, but our local library now has a seed lending program. I do a lot of work for them. This is interesting of having like local libraries part of this seed library program. Do you see a lot of that kind of um, partnerships happening? Yes, I've uh, instead of checking out a book, you check out a bean. <laughs> yeah. I think it's great. It's, <laughs> it's a wonderful way to do that, and it makes it available to more people. Some people that otherwise might not uh, have uh, access to these seeds. So I think it's it's a wonderful thing. Anything at all that promotes this, I think, is really great to raise awareness. Once you've grown a real tomato in your backyard, or you've eaten a real bean. See, beans suffered as much as the tomatoes. They toughened the hulls on those as well. Some of the modern varieties, you'd uh, put a dent in your sledgehammer if you tried to hit it with it. <laughs> but if you, once you've grown something in your backyard that's real, and people have more room than they think. I don't care if it's just a patio in the city. You can do container gardening. You can along your sidewalk. It's, it's amazing how many things you can grow in a very, very limited space. And and John, do you want to just give a a brief, um, maybe, explanation for how people can save seeds? Like if they grow plants, how do you actually save those seeds for your next season? Seed saving is a wonderful project. It gets in your blood, and once you've done it, you'll not, won't be able to stop. And it's so gratifying too. If you raise some beans or cucumber, I don't care what it is, when you save the seed out of that open pollinated variety, in other words, not a hybrid, but an open pollinated heritage variety, there's a certain self-satisfaction of being self-sufficient. So this is my seed. I grew this. I've saved this. And I've got it for myself and my family and for future generations, not to mention good taste. <laughs> Some of the things you want to remember with seed saving, it's it's really not rocket science, but it requires certain procedures. For instance, the main enemies of seed are heat, light, and moisture. You'd never dry seeds in the sunlight or in a window where the sun's shining in. You want them to have them in a cool, away from direct sunlight area spread out to dry. Now, if you're growing something like beans, let's say, or, or limas, has a big seed, if you're not sure about that, you can do the old shatter test. Take that lima bean and put it on the concrete. Take a hammer and hit it. If it's uh, hard to break or sort of rubbery, there's way too much moisture content in the seed. And that will rupture the cell walls if you try and freeze it. We want around 5 to 8% or maybe a little higher, but no more than that. And then those are ready. Once they're early dry, those are ready to store. I recommend storing them, and you can use uh, ball canning jars with the rubber gasket lid, screw top. That's an excellent way. Mostly in seed saving, they don't recommend Ziploc bags, but I've used them for years with, with excellent results. They've done just fine, and seeds will last for years and years if properly processed. Now, two things people might want to hear about. One is tomatoes, and the other is cucumbers. Tomato seed. If you want to save a variety of tomato, let that get pretty ripe and then squeeze that tomato or four or five, it depends on how much seeds you want to save. Squeeze that into a bowl, with all your juice and pulp, and let that ferment. Now, when it looks terrible and smells even worse, you're on the right track. Let that stay three or four days until that's totally fermented. What that's doing is that fermentation process is dissolving the gelatinous seed on the tomato. 
that's a germination inhibitor. Once that's dissolved, your good seed will float to the bottom or sink to the bottom, and your duds or misfires, as I call them, will come to the top. And then you run some water in there and begin to scoop that off in the sink, pour that into a small wire sieve, gently rub those seeds until they're entirely clean. And then I always take a towel and dry off the bottom of the sieve, take the excess water out, and then knock those out onto a plate, wax paper, a plate, anything that's a nonstick surface, and spread those out and let them dry for 10 days to two weeks. Once those uh, have dried, you can put those in an envelope. Make sure you've labeled it the year, the date, the variety of tomatoes. Nothing worse than saving two or three tomatoes and you don't uh, you think you're going to remember what's on each plate. I've done that before, and I have to package them up with a question mark. So we want to make sure you have all of your information. Now the same process I told you about with tomatoes applies to cucumbers. Cucumbers are fermented the same way, and again, they'll look terrible and smell even worse. And about about four days, your good seed goes to the bottom. Same process as the tomatoes. One good thing about tomatoes and cucumbers, both can last upwards of 10 years with just normal storage. So in storage, the best bet, especially for beans, any of your legumes, is once those are thoroughly dry, put those in the freezer and there's two reasons first of all longevity you can keep them for years and years and also weevil damage I'm sure that many of you've seen if you leave a bag of beans out too long you'll start to see weevils appearing that's just a fact of life when it comes to the legume family but once these have been frozen all danger of that's passed and they will last for years and years Without going into all of the details of seed saving, that gives you some general information. And I'll tell you an excellent book for anyone who wants to save seed. I'm pretty sure this is offered through the Seed Savers Exchange, and that is called, the book is called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. And that goes through all of the processes of saving seed. It gives you different families. In other words, if you're growing pepo squash families, zucchini, scallop squash, uh, any of those, yellow crookneck. It tells all of the, the class that it's in so that you isolate those from others and you won't have crossings. So it's it's a wealth of information for seed saving. I, I highly recommend that book. What a lot of great information and inspiration, John. <clears throat> this has been wonderful. Well, I, I certainly love doing it. Anna, is there anybody who has a burning question for us? I think we got all the questions that have been submitted, and we're actually about at the top of the hour here. I want to um, thank everyone again so much. This has been a wonderful, um, kind of feels like we're on a front porch having a conversation, and it's really nice just to hear from you guys down in the South and, um, you know, hear about these stories and traditions and delicious food. Um, I want to thank you guys all for, for joining us and um, just remind people quick two things. There's um, this call is part of our September membership drive, which is of course happening now. And today is the give what you can day. So if you go over to slowfoodusa.org, um, you can become a member of slow food for any amount. Um, and I also want to thank Camellia beans again. They've been a fantastic partner and they've, given our chapters these deeply rooted kits and made some available to members as well. So I want to thank Leanne especially and the folks at um, Seed at um, Camellia Beans. So with that, I, uh, I think that's a wrap. Any last words here? I love your thank song. You so I was gonna say, that was song. a highlight. <laughs> 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 I'm going to have thank that stuck you. in my head. Just a bowl of butter beans. <laughs> You should hear the second verse. <laughs> oh, is there a second? <laughs> we'll save that for another year. <laughs> Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Take care. All right. Thank okay. you. It's been a wonderful yeah. experience. Amazing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.